Chapter Seven of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Joy makes a request. After the midday meal, at which Joy Gargrave did not appear, Corporal Bracknell left the house and strolled down the road until he reached the place where the girl had passed him on the previous night. There he came to a standstill. His brow puckered in thought. Then he swung to the right in the same path where he had found Kona Dick lying in the snow. He had gone but a little way, however, when a noise behind him caused him to look round. Joy Gargrave was following him. He waited for her, and as she came up to him, she said, Mr. Bracknell, do you mind if I accompany you a little way? I should like to talk to you, if I may. It will be a pleasure, Miss Gargrave, he answered quite sincerely. Then if you do not mind, we will turn aside into the wood. I, I do not care for this path now, and we might be seen and interrupted by someone, and I have a request to make of you. I am entirely at your service, Miss Gargrave. Then we will turn here. She indicated a place where the wood thinned a little, and turning with her, he fell into step at her side, and waited for her to begin, wondering what she might have to say to him. Half a minute passed in silence, then she began abruptly. You will have heard that we are starting for England tomorrow? Yes, he answered. Mr. Rayner told me. The decision is rather sudden, isn't it? She nodded. The journey is a quite unexpected one just now. We had thought of waiting until the ice broke up and of canoeing down the river. But a letter has just come from Sir Joseph, Mr. Rayner's father, stating that my presence is required in England at the earliest possible moment. The letter has been delayed, and Mr. Rayner tells me that it is requisite that we should start at once. The business must be very urgent if you have to start on such a long journey at a day's notice commented the corporal. It is not altogether that, was the reply, though Mr. Rayner insists that it is imperative that we shall make an early start. The truth is, she broke off, and then resumed in a quavering voice, I am much upset by that mysterious affair of last night, and Mr. Bracknell, I am afraid, horribly afraid. Of what, he asked, looking into her beautiful face, to find it white and tense with emotion. Of my, my, of Dick Bracknell, she answered quietly. But if he is dead, what? Do you think he's dead, she cried sharply. Tell me, Mr. Bracknell, what do you really think? Last night, he answered slowly, I had no doubt whatever about it. But today, yes, today, she prompted anxiously, I'm not quite so sure. His complete disappearance perplexes me. If he were dead, as I thought, then someone has carried his body away, and if he were not dead, then someone must still have helped him, for he was in no condition to help himself. That is what you think, Mr. Bracknell. Do you know that there was a sledge in the wood to the left of that path? I saw the trail, he answered quietly, and I saw you following it. Whose sled was it? she asked thoughtfully. It was none of ours, and it was not yours, and it could not be that of a miner, for any such would have come to the lodge, as we keep open house for the men on trail. I do not know whose it can have been, answered the corporal thoughtfully. If we knew that, we should have the key to the whole of this mysterious affair, possibly. But whoever it was, he was anxious, as far as possible, to cover his tracks. He did not follow the trail up river. He crossed to the track on the other side, and then turned off into the wood. He lit a fire there. I found the ashes after I left you this morning. He must have halted there for a little time, for the snow was pretty well trampled. And when he resumed his journey, he marched parallel with the river, and descended to the ice again, just south of the bluff. I found his tracks coming down the bank there, and I imagine that from that point 
he must have followed the trail up river. Whoever could he be? asked the girl in perplexity. I do not know, but tomorrow I am going to find out. My dogs will be fresh then, and after the rest I shall be able to travel fast. Of one thing I am convinced, whoever the man was, he was not your husband. Dick Bracknell, as I said just now, was in no condition to help himself, certainly not to take the trail. For a moment Joy Gargrave did not speak, and as he looked at her he wondered what her thoughts were. He was still wondering when she broke the silence. Mr. Bracknell, I'm afraid, terribly afraid. Somehow I feel that your cousin is not dead. I feel he will come back here, and that is why we were hurrying away tomorrow morning. The letter from Sir Joseph Rayner serves as an excuse. Do you understand? I think I do, answered the corporal sympathetically. You are afraid that Dick, having found out where you are, will return to worry you. You know him. I have told you how I was trapped into marrying him. And do you think he is the man to leave me in peace? He is likely to consult only his own interests, agreed her companion. But I shall be safe from him in England, if what you tell me is true. He dare not go there openly, and if he were to appear at all, I should be able to protect myself by invoking the police. The police would only be too happy to afford you protection here, answered the corporal earnestly. The girl looked at him with grateful eyes. You mean yourself? Yes, I know. But there is another service that I want from you. You have but to name it, Miss Gargrave, he answered, as she hesitated. So far as duty allows, I am entirely at your service. Tell me what it is that I can do for you. You can find out from me whether Dick Bracknell is alive or dead. The corporal had not anticipated the request, and he was a little startled by it. Instantly his mind reverted to the conversation he had had with Rayner. He recalled the hopes which the latter entertained, and wondered if this white-faced girl at his side was willing to help their realization. As that possibility flashed into his mind, he was conscious of a constriction about his heart, but he gave no sign. I should be compelled to do that in any case, he answered quietly. I cannot relinquish the work on which I started until I know what has become of the man who is known at headquarters as Kuna Dick. Someone must know about him, probably the driver of the sled whose trail I followed, and I got to find out. Vague reports are not regarded as satisfactory by the heads of the force. You will let me know, she asked instantly. I shall be glad to do so, he answered quietly, and again he was conscious of the tightening about his heart. You see, she explained, my position is so anomalous. All my little world, with the exception of my Newham friend and yourself, my foster sister, whom I told only last night, think of me as a spinster. You are sure Mr. Rayner does not know of your marriage? asked the corporal quickly, as a thought struck him. I am quite sure, answered Joy readily, without giving any indication that she found any special significance in the question. You see, the part played by Lady Alcombe was not very credible, and I used my knowledge of it to ensure her silence. I wrote to her and told her that if the wedding was not kept secret, I should proclaim all that had happened to the world. Her vulnerable spot is the position she holds in society, and she knew how that would suffer if it became a matter of common knowledge that, for a bribe, she had schemed to marry to a scamp an innocent girl left in her charge. She wrote me a short note in reply in which she said that she would forget that the marriage had ever taken place and that I need not fear that it would ever become known. That is why I am so sure Mr. Rayner does not know. Lady Alcombe dared not betray me. Bracknell nodded. I dare say you are right, but of course you cannot marry again until you are sure of that. I do not want to marry again, interrupted the girl quickly, the blood flaming in her pale face. 
Why should you think that I do, Mr. Bracknell? As the corporal met her blue eyes, clear and unshadowed by guile, his heart grew suddenly light, and on the moment he dismissed from his mind the thought that Joy Gargrave in any way shared Mr. Rayner's aspirations. He laughed cheerfully as he replied, I did not say that I thought you wished to marry again, Miss Gargrave. I was merely stating the law on the matter, and there is no personal significance to be attached to such a statement. Joy Gargrave smiled austerely. I am not likely ever to marry again, she said. Once bitten, twice shy, you know. The corporal smiled in return. But as he marked her loveliness and remembered the figure at which the Northland had estimated Rolf Gargrave's wealth, he thought to himself that many a man would endeavor to persuade her to a different mind. But he did not say so. Miss Gargrave, one never knows what the future holds. But whatever happens, you can count on me as your friend. I am not proud of my relationship to Dick Bracknell, even though it does make me some sort of a cousin to you. There is nothing that I will not do to serve you, and if anything that I learn will deliver you from your anomalous position, you may rest assured that I will let you know of it at the earliest possible moment. Thank you, Mr. Bracknell, she answered simply. I shall be very grateful. They walked on a little way without speaking. Then she turned to him suddenly. You are my cousin, more or less, Mr. Bracknell, but I do not know your Christian name. It is Roger, he answered smilingly. And if at any time I want to communicate with you, where? Headquarters at Regina. They will always find me sooner or later, no matter what part of the territory I may be in. I'm glad to know that, she said, and if at any time you have news for me, any letter sent care of Sir Joseph Rayner will reach me. She turned in her steps as she spoke. I think I had better return now. There is much to do at the lodge, and they will miss me, but I am glad to have met you and glad to think that I can count you among my friends. She held out her mittened hand, and as he took it, Roger Bracknell felt the blood surge warmly in his face, and in his gray eyes, as he looked at her, there was a flame that, had she observed it, would have told her that she had secured more than a friend. But she did not see it, and as she walked away, there was a pensive look on the beautiful face. The next day, Corporal Bracknell, with his own team ready, harnessed, watched Joy Gargrave and her escort take their departure. Four full teams of dogs drew their equipment and snow having fallen during the night, Joy and her foster sister wore the great webbed snowshoes of the north. They stood making their goodbyes. Then the half-breed driver gave the word. Mush, mush, Linka! The leading dog gave a yelp and strained at his collar, and a moment later all the teams were moving southward. Joy Gargrave waved her hand as she moved on, and he waved back, and stood watching till the cavalcade was out of sight. Then, turning to his own dogs, he gave the word to move, and set his face towards the snowy solitudes of the north. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Kuna Dick As he traveled, Roger Bracknell's mind was busy with the events of the past two days, and with the information he had gathered. That his cousin Dick should have turned out to be the man whose trail he had followed had occasioned no wonder after the first shock of surprise. But the mystery of the attack upon him and of his subsequent disappearance afforded him much food for thought. Someone had determined that Dick Bracknell should die, and someone had shot him. The question was, who was it? He had dismissed from his mind any idea that Joy herself 
had any complicity in that business, her frankness having quite killed the suspicions he had at first been inclined to entertain. His thoughts swung round to Rayner. Did he know anything of the matter? He could find no satisfactory answer. It was true that immediately after the crime he had seen him entering the lodge with a rifle, and he had certainly shown a keen interest about the sled which had waited in the wood. But from the first he had casually offered a sufficient explanation, and the instinct which turns every man into an amateur detective on the occasion of a mysterious crime would easily account for the second. Besides, Rayner could have nothing to do with the disappearance of Dick Bracknell's body, for the corporal was quite sure that he had never left the house until he had done so with himself. True, he had betrayed a certain knowledge as to the place where the crime had been committed, but he himself might easily have communicated that knowledge to Rayner, though he could not recollect having done so, while on the other hand, the motive for such a serious crime as murder was not immediately apparent. It was true that Rayner designed to marry Joy Gargrave, but that of itself was not a sufficient motive unless he knew of the previous marriage. But does Rayner know of that marriage? He uttered the question aloud and answered it in the same way, speech helping him to precipitate his thoughts. I think not. The girl is so positive, and Rayner has given no sign. There's the deuce of a coil to be unwound somehow. He reached the bluff, turned it, and saw the junction of the tributary Elkhorn with the main river. When he reached it, he halted his dogs and made a careful inspection of the trail. The new snow had drifted, but the thick pine wood which grew on the banks of the smaller stream had turned the snow in places and about two hundred yards up he came on the half-obliterated traces of sled-runners. He examined them carefully, stood for a moment or two in thought, then nodded his head. Turned up here out of the main trail, and will probably have made a camp somewhere. Anyway, it's worth trying. He went back for his dogs, and he turned up the elkhorn. The trail at first was not very bad and he made a good pace. But after the first two miles it worsened, and he struck an abundance of soft snow, presenting an absolutely virgin surface. This made the going very hard, and he marched ahead of his laboring dogs, packing the snow with the great webbed shoes of the north, lifting each foot clear almost perpendicularly, then planting it down to harden the surface for his canine team. Three miles or so he had made, in spite of the cold, sweating like a bull, and then he reached the place where the wind had swept the ice like a broom, leaving it almost clear of snow. He examined the frozen surface, and after a little search, found the marks of sled runners on the ice. He searched further, but found nothing save these twin scars running parallel to one another. But one sled had passed that way and he was sure that he was on the right track. A smile of satisfaction came on his lean face, and seating himself on the sled, he swung forward at a rattling pace. The short day was coming to a close when the leading dog yelped suddenly, and with his followers began to manifest signs of canine excitement. Roger Bracknell himself sniffed the keen air. There was a fire somewhere, for the unmistakable odor of burning resinous wood reached his nostrils. He stepped off the sled, and hanging on the gee pole, tried to check the pace of his team. His efforts, however, were in vain. The dogs bent their heads to the ice and threw themselves against the collars, hurrying forward, as they had not hurried all day. They, too, smelt the burning pine wood and to them it signified not merely human habitation, but freedom from the traces and the frozen salmon which constituted their evening meal. The corporal, finding his endeavors to restrain them vain, prepared for eventualities. Hanging on to the sled with one hand, 
and with the other he unfastened the holster wherein he carried his service pistol. He did not know what to expect. The aromatic odor might come from an Indian teepee, from the hut of some lonely prospecting party, or from the camp of the man he was following. In any case, it was as well to be prepared. The leading dog yelped again, and the others responded in joyful chorus. The team swung suddenly towards the left bank, up a slight incline towards a clearing in the wood. Out of the gathering gloom a faint glow appeared, and then the shadowy outline of a hut. The glow was from a frosted parchment window, and the hut was the typical miner's cabin of the north. Corporal Bracknell smiled and dropped his hand from the pistol holster, finding the look of the place altogether reassuring. The dogs came to a standstill on the packed snow in front of the cabin, yelping, delight, and whip in hand, Bracknell waited, listening. If there were dogs at the cabin, they might be expected to charge the newcomers, who fastened in the traces would be heavily handicapped. The charge he waited for did not come. There was no challenging answer to the yelping of his own team, and apparently the owner of the cabin was without dogs, or if he owned a team, it was absent from home. This fact further reassured him and threw him still more off his guard. He stepped forward to the door of the cabin and rapped upon it with the butt end of his dog whip. Come in, answered a hoarse voice. The corporal felt for the moose hide thong that worked the wooden catch, opened the door, and stepping inside, turned to close it behind him. That's right, said the voice again. Now put your hands up. The corporal jumped, and his hands moved instinctively towards the holster as he swung round. Don't, snapped the voice. Put them up, or by... Bracknell recognized the folly of resistance, and as he raised his hands above his head, his eyes swept the cabin for the speaker. A slush lamp against the wall, and a glow from the roaring Yukon stove gave light to the middle of the cabin but the corners were in comparative darkness, and it was a second or two before he located the owner of the voice. Then, in a bunk in the corner furthest from the door, he caught sight of a man propped among furs and blankets. On the edge of the bunk rested a hand which held a heavy pistol pointing at himself. The face that he looked into was that which he had last seen in the death-like repose in the snow near North Star Lodge, the face of Kuna Dick. The eyes of the latter glittered wickedly in the firelight, and while the officer waited, the voice spoke again mockingly. The end of the long trail, hey, Bobby? The corporal did not reply. Apparently his cousin was alone and comparatively helpless, or he would scarcely have waited his entrance lying in the bunk. His eyes measured the distance between them, and he speculated what chance there was of the success of a sudden spring proving successful. But the man on the bunk evidently divined what was passing through his mind. For a second later, he broke the silence again. I wouldn't try it, officer, not if I were you. I may be a sick man, but I can still shoot. Roger Bracknell looked at the hand resting on the edge of the bunk. It was perfectly steady. He recognized the hopelessness of any attack proving successful, until the sick man was off his guard, and nodded casually. I give you best, he answered, speaking for the first time. The man on the bunk gave a chuckling laugh. You seem wise, he replied, and if you do just what I tell you, you'll prove you are. You've got a gun, of course, in that holster of yours. Well, when I give the word... You will unbuckle the belt and fling it, pistol and all, under the bunk here. No tricks, mind you. If your hand strays an inch from the buckle, I fire, and I warn you that I am a dead shot. Now you can get to work. The corporal dropped his hands to his belt, and as his fingers worked at the stiff buckle, wondering if he might run the risk of trying for his pistol. Quick, you're too long, cried the man in the bunk. 
Roger Bracknell hesitated for a second. His fingers fumbled at the buckle. Then the belt swung loose in his hands. Throw it, came the command, in a peremptory voice. The corporal threw it along the floor, and it slid to the edge of the bunk. Then his cousin laughed again. Wisdom is justified of her children. If you had a pious upbringing, Bobby, you will recognize the scripture. And now, having got rid of your arsenal, you can sit down at the table and put your hands upon it. That will be easier for you than standing there trying to touch the roof. But I warn you again, no monkey tricks, or... The pistol moved significantly, and the corporal moved towards the rough table, constructed out of a packing case. Keep your hands up and shove that stool forward with your feet. The stool referred to was a log of wood, which, as the corporal recognized, would prove a very good missile if a man had time to lift and throw it. Evidently his mentor realized that also, and was taking no chances, so, still at the pistol point, Corporal Bracknell pushed the log forward to the table, and then, on his captor's instructions, seated himself with his arms resting on the table. Now, said the sick man with a short laugh, we can talk in peace. Talk away, answered the corporal cheerfully. I will, replied the other sharply. There's a question that I want to ask you. Why did you pop me in the woods at North Star Lodge three nights ago? That sort of thing is against the rules of your service, isn't it? It is, answered the corporal, and the answer to your other question is that I didn't pot you. You didn't? Hey, then who the devil did? I would give a goodish bit to know, was the corporal's reply. The thing is a mystery to me. But it's no mystery to me, answered the other, a trifle passionately. You did it, and it's no use trying to bluff me. I know you've been on my track for weeks, and that you were determined to get me by fair means or foul. If you think that lying is going to help you... I'm not lying, interrupted Roger Bracknell. I give you my word of honor that I am telling you the truth, and I say that not because I'm afraid. It is true that I was trailing you, and that I was close at your heels at North Star, but I never shot you. I found you lying in the snow as I thought, dead. But I'd nothing whatever to do with the shooting. The devil, cried the sick man, and from his tones, the corporal knew that he was convinced. Then who did it? The corporal saw a chance of further surprising his questioner, and took it. Well, there was the person whom you went to meet, your wife, you know. My wife? There was amazement in Dick Bracknell's tones and for a moment after the exclamation he stared at the officer like the man who could not believe his ears. "'Yes, your wife, Joy Gargrave,' answered the corporal steadily. "'You went to meet her in the wood, didn't you?' Dick Bracknell did not reply. His lips pursed themselves, and he began to whistle thoughtfully to himself while he stared at the man whose question he left unanswered. The corporal smiled a little and continued. I should think that you would be the first to admit that Joy Gargrave was not without grievances sufficient to warrant extreme action on her part. You can put that notion out of your noodle at once, replied the other harshly. If you know Joy at all, you know that the idea of shooting me is the very last thing that would enter her head. She's not that sort. The corporal remembered Joy's confession, and smiled whimsically at the unconscious irony of her husband's testimony. Then, still trying to move the other to some indiscretion of speech, he answered quietly, "'You believe in Joy Gargrave? But have you thought what she must feel like? There are plenty of women who—' "'Drop it,' broke in the sick man harshly. "'The motion is preposterous.' I won't listen to it, and I warn you, I don't share Joy's scruples about shooting. Nor about anything else, I imagine, answered the corporal with a short laugh. But we can easily settle whether Joy did it or not. Which side did the shot come from? 
Now you're asking me something, answered the wounded man. There were two shots, and they came from both sides of me. It was a regular ambuscade, and whoever fired meant to get me. Where were you hit? asked the corporal. Left shoulder, drilled clean through, was the reply. And which way were you facing when the thing happened? asked the corporal. Think carefully, it is rather important. I was facing up the path with my back to the main road. I had heard something moving and had turned around just at that moment. That settles it, answered the corporal emphatically. It was the shot from the left that did for you, and your wife was on the right. But who was on the left? Tell me that if you can, my Solomon. Corporal Bracknell shook his head. There you hit one of the mysteries of this business. I don't know. I wish I did. But as sure as my name is Roger Bracknell. As sure as what? The interruption came like a pistol shot, and the wounded man leaned forward with amazement showing in his face. What name did you say you called yourself? Roger Bracknell, answered the corporal quietly. Hmm, responded the other, peering at him thoughtfully. Then he said suddenly, Take off that chapeau of yours. The corporal removed his fur cap and sat with it in his hand, while the other searched his face with inquisitive eyes. There was a moment's silence, and then the wounded man spoke again. It beats the band. You are my cousin, Roger, right enough. And this is a nice dramatic meeting. Drury Lane isn't in it with us, though what the blazes are you doing as a mounter beats me. I thought you were at the bar. And I didn't know you were Kuna Dick until three nights ago. I had your description given me, and that cut across your cheekbone was particularized. That and the beard you wear are acquisitions since the old days at Harrow Fell. And even when I looked at your face the other night, I never associated Kuna Dick with Dick Bracknell. How did you come to know? asked the other curiously. I picked up that note which you sent to your wife, asking her to meet you and naming the place. You had begun to write your surname and then crossed it out. That gave me the first inkling that you and Kuna Dick were one and the same. And of course when I talked to Joy Gargrave, I knew that what I suspected was the fact. And knowing what you now know, you would still arrest me? As he asked the question, Dick Bracknell leaned forward a little, and the hand that held the pistol hung loosely over the edge of the bunk. The corporal noticed it and shifted his grip on the heavy fur cap in his hand. I should be compelled to. Duty is duty, you know. But, man, I'm your cousin, came the protest. Yes, more is the pity. As he replied, the corporal's arm moved suddenly, and the fur cap was jerked across the room right into the sick man's face. The corporal himself followed it like lightning, and as he reached the bunk, gripped his cousin's pistol hand. The weapon went off once, twice, and the bullets plugged the logs of the cabin, while Dick Bracknell shouted imprecations. The policeman caught the barrel of the pistol and turned it away from himself, while with the other hand he caught his cousin's wrist and dug his thumb into the sinews of it in order to force him to release his hold. In the midst of the struggle there was a sudden clamor of dogs outside, but neither of the men noticed it. The pistol cracked again, and at that moment the door opened, and an Indian rushed in. Apparently he took in the situation in a glance. There was a heavy dog-whip in his hand, and in an instant he had swung it and brought the loaded stock down upon the corporal's head. The latter did not even cry out. He doubled up like a doll out of which the stuffing had been ripped, and lay in a crumpled heap upon the hard mud floor. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Husk of the Prodigal. When Roger Bracknell came to himself, he had a splitting head, 
and no exact recollection of recent events. His head ached so much that he felt moved to press his temples with his hands, but found that that was impossible to do, owing to his arms being bound to his side. On making that discovery, he lay quite still, with his eyes closed, thinking over the situation. Little by little, memory came back to him, and he remembered what had befallen. But his remembrance of events ceased with a moment when his cousin's pistol had cracked for the third time. Had the bullet struck him? He did not know. But at that moment, through the drums throbbing in his head, a voice sounded in his ear, a voice that had external reality, and the tones of which he recognized. Do you think he's dead, Joe? He lies still enough. A guttural voice grunted some reply, and there was a sound of movement near him. He opened his eyes to find himself looking into a dark, frost-scarred face, from which a single eye gleamed malevolently. As that eye encountered his, the dark face was lifted and turned from him, and he caught the reply given over the speaker's shoulder. Him eyes open. He all right. That's good hearing. I don't want him to die on our hands, at least not until I have had a little more conversation with him. The man Joe gave a careless reply and moved away. Corporal Bracknell craned his neck a little and looked around. The slush lamp was still burning, but through the parchment window the gray light of the northern day penetrated, from which fact he deduced that he had lain where he was many hours. In front of the stove, the man of the evil face, whom he had seen on opening his eyes, was busy preparing a meal, and the odor of frying moose steak and bacon filled the cabin. In the bunk, propped up among the furs with his left arm in an improvised sling, he descried his cousin, puffing at a pipe and regarding him with thoughtful gaze. Their eyes met, and Dick Bracknell smiled. "'Morning, Cousin Roger. I hope that head of yours is not very bad.' "'It is only Midland,' answered the corporal, truthfully. Hmm, I suspected so. Joe there,' he indicated the Indian, bending over the stove, "'doesn't know his strength, and he's a holy terror with a whipstock. You should see him tackle a big wolf-dog that's turned savage. It's a sight for gods and men.' Roger Bracknell did not reply. He had not been aware of the Indian's entrance on the previous night, but in a flash he divined what had happened to him, and why his head ached so intolerably. His cousin continued with mocking affability. He hit you rather hard, I'm afraid, but we Bracknells are all a little thick in the skull, and I hope that no real harm will follow on Joe's forceful intervention. In any case, you must own that his arrival was a most opportune one. I can well believe you found it so, answered the corporal. I did, Roger, my boy, I did. You surprised me last night. I didn't think you would have gone for a wounded and disabled man. It was scarcely chivalrous, you know. You were armed, was the reply. I wasn't. Dick Bracknell waved his pipe airily. We will let it pass. What is done is done, and the past is always to be reckoned as irrevocable, as I know better than most of the parsons. The present and future are my immediate concern, and the question is, what am I to do with you? That, answered the corporal quietly, is scarcely for me to decide. No, replied his cousin with a little laugh, but it is a question in which you should be interested. Roger Bracknell was interested, intensely interested, but he strove his best to appear unconcerned, and after a moment his cousin continued. Joe there has a very simple solution. He suggests another knock on the head and a sepulcher in the river through an ice hole. It is a course that would be advantageous to me, since your body would not be found before the ice breaks up in the spring, if then, and in the interval we should have time to clear out of the territories. The corporal knew that what he said was true, and shivered a little as he contemplated the suggested way of getting rid of him. 
but his voice was firm as he asked casually, "'Why don't you accept that solution?' "'Why don't I accept?' began the other, and then broke off, glowering at the man, who, though in his power, was apparently undismayed. Then a sneer came on his face. "'Blood is thicker than water,' he remarked. "'Though you're willing to forget that we are cousins, and regardless of family ties, are prepared to follow your damned sense of duty, I can't forget it. And I'm inclined to spare you, and even to cut those bonds of yours on conditions.' "'On conditions? What are they?' asked the corporal. "'That you give me your word of honor that you will not attempt to escape or to attack Joe or myself while you are with us.' The corporal wondered what was in his cousin's mind, and what was behind the offer, but he was careful not to probe into the matter openly. "'You will accept my word of honor?' he asked, with a faint touch of surprise in his voice. "'Yes,' answered his cousin, sneeringly. "'You see, I know you of old. The Bracknell strain runs true in you, while it has a twist in me. I know you won't break your parole if you give it and of course you will give it. It is your word or your life. <laughs> Quite a Dick Turpin's touch there, eh? Roger Bracknell considered the matter swiftly. So far as he could see, there was nothing to be gained by rejecting the offer, since he was completely in the other's hands, and though his cousin sneered, he was clearly quite in earnest. I might be disposed to give you my word, if— man broke in the other savagely you'd better there are no ifs and buts about it look at joe there he doesn't strike you as one who will be over delicate does he if i let him loose you'll be running down the elkhorn under the ice inside of ten minutes you'd better agree and quickly no he lifted his pipe to check the words on the corporal's lips hear me out there's another condition yet and it's this as soon as I am able to travel, you will accompany me without demur for four days. On the fifth day, I'll release you, and you can do your worst. The corporal hesitated. There was something here that he did not understand, and again he wondered what lay behind the proposal. His cousin watched him, and as he did not speak, addressed him again. I may remind you what the situation is. You are in my power. If you can't give me your word, if I don't fall in with Joe's more primitive suggestion, I can keep you tied up here, and I can leave you tied up when we move on, or I can lash you onto a sledge and willy-nilly take you along with us. That must be quite plain to you, but I prefer an amicable arrangement. You will give me your word. Corporal Racknow recognized the truth of his cousin's utterances. There was little choice in the matter, and after a little more reflection, he agreed. Yes, Dick, I give you my word of honor. I thought you would. Dick Bracknell laughed shortly as he spoke, and then turned to his Indian companion. Just take your knife, Joe, and cut those thongs. The Indian turned from the stove and growled something in a dialect which the corporal did not understand. He guessed, however, that the Indian was demurring and with mingled feelings waited to see what would happen. His cousin spoke again, and this time there was a peremptory note in his voice. Cut those thongs, I tell you, and don't stand there growling at things you don't understand. He added something in his native tongue, and watching the Indian's scowling face, the corporal saw the frown lift, and a flicker of evil laughter leap into the single eye. A moment later the Indian stepped up to him, and with a hunting knife cut the hide thongs which bound him, and then returned to the stove. The corporal stretched his arms, then his whole body, and after that rose slowly to his feet. His cousin watched him with eyes that smiled inscrutably. "'Feels better, hey? You're a sensible man, Cousin Roger, and now I guess we shall get along famously. A pity, though, that I shan't be able to sit down to breakfast with you. What I can't understand is how you come to be here at all, blurted the corporal. Oh, laughed the other, that's as simple as you please. When I was plugged down by North Star, 
I must have lapsed into unconsciousness for the first time on any stage. While I was lying there in the snow... I examined you, broke in the corporal. I thought that you were dead. But as you see, I wasn't, replied the other. And while I was lying there in the snow, Joe, who was waiting with the dogs, having heard the shots, came to look for me. He carried me to the sled, took me to the woods on the other side of the river, made a fire, and having doctored me, brought me along here. He's a good sort, is Joe, though his looks are against him. The corporal did not reply. From the trails he had found in the snow, he had already guessed part of the story which he had just heard, and was not surprised at it. The wounded man laughed shortly. Joe is attached to me. I once did him a service, and if I told him to do it, he'd run amuck through Regina Barracks without demur. He doesn't love the mounted police, as he owes his lost eye to one of them. So you will see, cousin, that only my family affection saves you. The Indian turned his scarred face from the stove and laid the table in primitive fashion. Then, having attended to his master, he placed a tin plate with moose meat and beans before the corporal, filled a mug with steaming coffee, and, with a grunt, invited him to eat. The officer did so readily enough. He had eaten nothing for fourteen hours and was feeling hungry. Plain fare, commented his cousin, but wholesome. And if one brings to it the sauce of hunger, it's at least as good as anything we had at Harrow Fell. That reminds me, cousin, how is the governor? The corporal remembered the dignified Sir James Bracknell as he had last seen him, and although he had his own quarrel with him, he felt resentment at the tone in which the question was asked. He was very well when I last saw him, he answered stiffly. How long ago is that? Two years. Hmm, that's a goodish time. May I inquire if he knows your whereabouts? I think not. I didn't tell him of my intentions when I came here. We, uh, had a difference of opinion. Dick Bracknell laughed. I don't blame you for that. He's a starchy old buffer, is the governor, and a regular preambulating pepper pot. He was silent for a moment, and then he inquired jerkily, How did he take the, uh, little affair of mine? You mean the selling of the plans of the Travis gun? There's no need for you to be brutal, was the sharp reply. I've paid pretty heavily for that piece of madness. You're to remember that I'm the heir of Harrow Fell, and that if I show my nose in England, I shall probably get five years at Portland or Dartmoor. The corporal knew that this was true, and was conscious of a little compunction. Without alluding to it, he answered the question. Sir James took that very badly. It was hushed up, of course, but when you disappeared, and your name was gazetted among the broken, he pressed for an explanation and got it. As you can guess, proud old man as he is, it wasn't a nice thing for him to hear. No, poor old governor. A strained silence followed, and a full two minutes passed without anyone speaking. Then the corporal glanced at his cousin. The latter was sitting in his bunk, staring straight before him with a troubled look in his eyes. He moved as the corporal looked at him, and as their eyes met, he laughed in a grating way. The husks are not good eating, he commented, and I've been feeding on them ever since the day I skipped from Alcombe. The corporal was still silent, a little amazed at his cousin's mood, and the other spoke again. Don't you go thinking I never regret things, Roger, my boy. There never was a prodigal yet who didn't lie awake a night thinking of what a fool he'd been. And for some of us there's no going back to scoop the ring and the robe and to feast on the fatted veal. There are times when I think of the fell and hear the pheasants clucking in the spinney, and I never sight at a termagon, but I think of the grouse driving down the wind on Harrow Moor. Man, it's hell undiluted. The corporal pushed the tin plate from him. He felt strangely moved. 
He had thought of his cousin as wholly bad, and now he found good mingled with the evil. He turned round. Dick, old man, he said in an unsteady voice, you might make good yet if you tried. His cousin laughed harshly. Not me. You know better. What were you after me for? Whiskey running? Yes, I thought so. That's bad enough for a man of a... My antecedents, but there are worse things credited to Kuna Dick, as you'll learn. I've got too far. What is it that fellow Kipling says? Damned from here to eternity? That's me, and I know it. You can pull up, urged the other. You can make reparation. Reparation, exclaimed the other. Ah, you're thinking of Joy, my wife, aren't you? Yes, answered the corporal simply. Dick Bracknell's mood changed swiftly. What's joy to you, he demanded hoarsely. You know her. You've talked with her. Consoled her, I don't doubt. What's she to you? As he spoke, his tones became violent, and he half threw himself out of the bunk as if he would attack his cousin. The Indian started to his feet, and his one eye glared at the officer malevolently. The corporal did not move. As his cousin shouted the question, the blood flushed his face, and in his heart he knew that he could not answer the question with the directness demanded. "'Don't be a fool, Dick,' he replied quietly. "'I never saw Joy Gargrave till four days ago. And if I talk of reparations, well, you'll own it is due to her.' Dick Bracknell's jealous passion died down as suddenly as it had flamed. He threw himself back in the bunk and laughed shakily. Perhaps you're right, he said, but it is one of the things that can't be done. You could let her divorce you, blurted out the corporal. It would be the decent thing to do. When did I ever do the decent thing, retorted his cousin, sneeringly. No, Joy's my wife, and I'll keep her. It is something to know that there are millions I could dip my hands into some day and a warm breast I can flee to. Not now at any rate, broke in the corporal sharply, only by an effort restraining himself. Joy has started for England. For England? When? Dick Bracknell's face and tones expressed amazement, but his next words were burdened with suspicion. You're not lying to me? No, it's the truth. Joy started for England yesterday morning. I saw her start. And I can't follow, commented the prodigal bitterly. That's part of the price I pay. He did not speak again for a long time, and the corporal charged his pipe, lit it, and sat smoking, staring into the stove, and reflecting on the mess his cousin had made of his life. At the end of half an hour, the Indian went out, and then Dick Bracknell broke the silence. I wonder what Joy thinks of me. Did she tell you? She knows how she was trapped. You are aware of that, of course. I think she will never forgive you. I'm not surprised, was the reply, and yet, Roger, I think the world of her. When I married her, I loved her, and I wasn't thinking of her money over much. It was Lady Alcombe who put that rotten scheme into my head. If I had only been patient and run straight, and not been tempted by that agent to sell the secret of the Travis gun, but there's a whole regiment of ifs, so what's the use of gassing? Anyway, Joy's mine, and no man else can get her while I live. It was the last word he said upon the subject, and nearly three weeks later, having recovered sufficiently to travel, he journeyed with his cousin and the Indian up the Elkhorn. On the fourth morning of that journey, Roger Bracknell woke to find that preparations were already well advanced for departure. One team was already harnessed with a larger complement of dogs than usual, while his own sled, with three dogs standing by, was still unharnessed. His cousin indicated it with a jerk of his head. We part company today, Roger. I'm sorry to rob your dog team, but Joe insists, as he's afraid you'll get down to the police post too soon for us. If we leave you your full team, besides, we're tackling a stiff journey, and we shall need dogs before we're through. We're starting immediately, 
and you'll have to breakfast alone. And by the time you're through with it, your parole is off. You understand? The corporal nodded, and his cousin continued. With only three dogs, you won't be such a fool as to try and trail us. And we've left you enough grub to get you down to North Star comfortably. Your rifle's there on the top of your sled, and I trust you not to try and use it on us till you've eaten your breakfast. So long, old man. He turned lightly away without waiting for his cousin to speak, and the corporal heard him humming an old chanson of the voyagers. Aha, Babette, we go away, but we will come again, Babette, again back home. On. The song failed suddenly, and as Joe the Indian cracked his whip to the waiting dogs, Dick Bracknell looked back over his shoulder. His face was white and twisted as if with pain, and there was anguish in his eyes. The corporal took a hasty step towards him, but was waved back, and the team moved forward, the runners singing on the wind-swept ice. For ten minutes the officer stood watching, until the cavalcade passed out of sight behind a tree-clad island. But Dick Bracknell did not look back once. The corporal turned to the fire with a musing look upon his face, and while he prepared breakfast, his mind was with the man traveling up the river. The interrupted chanson haunted him, and he found himself searching for the unsung fragment. For a time it eluded him, but presently he found it and hummed it to himself. On Easter Day, back home to play on Easter Day, Babette, Babette. And as he found it, he understood, to the full, the look of pain upon his cousin's face. Again he looked up the river. Beyond the island a line of black dots appeared, and by them marched two larger dots. Poor devil, he murmured, as he turned again to the fire. End of chapter 9「10 of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A desperate situation. An hour later, Roger Bracknell started on his way back to the police post in a not very happy frame of mind. The chief of Fort Pilgrim was a man with little tolerance for failure, and the corporal knew that when he made his report it would be received with frowns. That was inevitable, but there was nothing for it but to return. His cousin and the Indian Joe had taken very effective measures to prevent him following on their trail when they had left him with a depleted dog team and with only sufficient rations to carry him as far as North Star Lodge. Sorry as he was for his cousin, he yet resented the action which had left him helpless, and his failure rankled as he swung steadily forward on the southward trail. Before the end of the day, however, a thought came to him. Duty was duty, and if he could reach North Star Lodge, there would be dogs there, and he could requisition them in the king's name, and return to the pursuit. It did not seem a very nice thing to contemplate, but his oath of service left him no option. While the officer at Fort Pilgrim was bound to look askance at the whole affair, if he returned to explain that Kuna Dick was his cousin and that he had escaped him. Besides, there was joy to consider. She could never be safe from molestation while Dick Bracknell was at large. It was even possible that the latter, finding the territory growing too hot for him, might venture to follow her to England, and as her husband, claim his rights. That must be prevented at all costs, even at the cost of Dick's suffering incarceration in the penal prison at Stony Mountain. The end of the day, however, brought an unlooked-for event which made an end of these half-formed plans. He had camped for the night, and having fed his dogs with the dried salmon roe, which formed their staple food, was preparing his own meal when one of the animals gave a sudden sharp howl of pain. He looked hastily round, and saw the dog twisted in some kind of spasm, its backbone arched, its legs jerking in a strange fashion. 
He went to it, and as he approached, the spasm ended, and the dog lay in the snow completely exhausted. He was stooping over it, wondering what was the matter, when the other two dogs howled simultaneously, and he turned swiftly to see one of them leap straight in the air, and, in a moment, both of them were in spasms similar to the one he had already witnessed, and before his eyes one of them curled up like a bow, then suddenly relaxed and lay stark and dead. A dark suspicion shot through his mind as he jerked himself upright. The first dog was plainly at the point of death, while the third was twisted by spasms that could have but one ending. He knew that there could be no recovery, that he could do nothing for them, and in a swift impulse of mercy he drew his pistol and shot them. Then he strode to the sled, and lifting the small bale of dog food, carried it to the fire, and by the flames of the burning pine examined it carefully. He had not to look long before he came upon some small white crystals in the creases of the row. They might be snow, they might be frost crystals, but he did not think that they were either, and selecting one of the smallest of the white specks, he placed it on his tongue. It was exceedingly bitter in taste. Strychnine, he cried aloud, and then stood looking at the dead dogs with horror shining in his eyes. As he stood there, one question was beating in his brain. Who had done this thing? Who? Who? His thoughts flew back to his cousin. Had he? No. He could not believe that, for whoever had placed the strychnine in the dog food had callously planned to murder him. And bad as Dick Bracknell was, the corporal felt that his cousin would not have done a thing like this. There's that Indian, Joe, he said, speaking his thoughts aloud. From what Dick said, he was afraid of me, and he would have disposed of me at the beginning if he had had his way. He was silent for a little time, then he nodded his head. Yes, the Indian did it without Dick's knowledge. For the moment he refused to think further about the matter. About him was the gloom of the pines, with their pall of snow and everywhere the terrible silence of the North. Alone and without dogs to carry his stores, the situation was altogether desperate, and to reflect upon it overmuch was the court madness. So he put the thought of it from him for the time being, and after dragging the dead dogs into the shadow of the forest, resumed the preparation of his evening meal. When he had eaten it, he erected a windscreen and lying in a sleeping bag with his feet to the fire, lighted a pipe, and once more considered the problem before him. It was at least four days' journey to North Star Lodge, probably five or six, since he would have to carry the necessaries of life himself, and so burdened would not be able to travel fast. There was food for four days on the sled, and to make sure of reaching North Star, he would have to put himself on rations and travel as fast as he could. Barring accidents, there was an even chance of his getting through. But if any ill chance arose, then... He did not finish the thought. Knocking the ashes out of his pipe, he stretched himself down in the sleeping berth, and presently fell asleep. When he awoke, it was still dark, and the fire was burning low. He looked at his watch. It was five o'clock. He stretched himself a little, and thrusting his arm out of the sleeping bag, he threw a couple of spruce boughs on the fire. The resinous wood quickly caught, and as it flared up, he looked round. On the edge of the circle of light, which his fire cut out of the darkness, something caught his eye. He looked again. Two tiny globes of light, about three feet above the ground, appeared to be suspended on nothing. He watched them steadily, and, for the briefest moment of time, saw them eclipsed, then they reappeared. He looked further. There were other twin globes of light scattered all round, and as the spruce crackled in the flame, he caught sight of an animal's head and the outline of its form. Timberwolves, he whispered to himself. Feeling for his automatic pistol, he lay waiting his opportunity. Undoubtedly, the bodies of his dead dogs had already served the savage beasts for a meal, and now they were watching him, perhaps already counting him their prey. He did not feel particularly afraid. He knew 
that the wolf is really a coward, and that unless driven by hunger, it seldom attacks man, but all the same, he thought it wise to teach the beast a lesson. So when the shadowy form of one of the beasts moved, he sighted and fired. The wolf gave a yelp, jumped clean in the air, and dropped dead well within the circle of firelight. He looked round again. The watching eyes in the darkness had disappeared. Presently, however, they returned, and lying perfectly still, he saw a gaunt dog wolf slink out of the shadows towards its dead comrade and fall on it with its teeth. Another followed, and another, and a moment later there was a snarling tangle of furry beasts where the dead wolf had been. Who, he whistled to himself, as he noted their disregard of the firelight. They're mad with hunger. He emptied his pistol into the bunch, and the pack fell back, leaving three of its number dead in the snow. Of the first wolf, nothing remained but the skull and tail. Behind the trees, the snarling yelping continued, and as he crept out of his sleeping bag, he conjectured that others of the beasts had been injured by his shots and were falling prey to their hungry companions. There was a serious look upon his face as, crossing to the other side of the fire, he picked up the dead wolves and one by one flung them into the darkness, where, as his ears assured him, they also became food for their famished packmates. He had meant to commence his journey at an early hour, but the presence of the wolf pack forced him to reconsider his plans and to delay until dawn. The interval he filled by packing his stores in a convenient form for carrying, and with the aid of things from the sled and his sleeping bag, he devised a knapsack, which, while it bulked large, was not really heavy. Then he breakfasted, and that done, as the dawn broke, looked round once more. On one side of him the wolves were still in the shadows of the trees, and as he turned to look on the other, his eye caught the package of poisoned salmon roe, which was still upon the sledge. A thought struck him. The very thing, he muttered, and going to the sled, he broke up the food with an axe and then scattered it in small portions about the camping place. I shall bag some of them for certain, he said, as he saw the wolves watching him. When they find it, they'll bolt like one o'clock. The day had well broken when, adjusting his snowshoes, he shouldered his pack and stepped out on the trail. None of the wolves were now in sight, but he had gone only a little way when a sharp howl behind him told him that they were still about. He looked back. A little spur of trees on the bank hid his late camp, but as he glanced back, a wolf leaped on the ice, ran howling a short way, then dropped in the snow. Other yelps of pain came from behind the screen of trees, and as the sound reached him, a sigh of satisfaction came in his eyes. "'It's working like a charm,' he said to himself. There's an end of Mr. Wolf for this trip, I fancy. As he journeyed, he kept a sharp lookout, turning frequently to observe the trail behind him. Not a single wolf appeared, and through the short day he marched on, a solitary living thing in a landscape that was unutterably forlorn and desolate. The quick night drew on, and he decided to camp. Halting in a sheltered cove, he fell to small spruits, gathered some dry twigs, and built himself a fire. Then he thrust his hands into his tunic pocket for matches. They were gone. He had lost them. For a minute or two he was filled with dismay, and real terror clutched at his heart strings. For to be without means of making a fire in the desolate Northland is to have entered the valley of the shadow of death. Then he recalled an old device of the voyagers and proceeded to put it into execution. With his jackknife, he cut some thin shavings of spruce, mixed them with a handful of dead lichen scraped from trees, and biting the bullets from a couple of cartridges, shook the powder of one over the little heap that he had made, and with that from the other cartridge made a short train. Then he fired his pistol to light the train. The powder caught, spluttered, and burned out, without lighting the lichen and the pine shavings. 
and the operation had to be performed three times before it was successful. He built up his fire, and when it was well going, and he was congratulating himself on his success, a thought struck him. Hastily, he examined his bandolier. He had but three cartridges left. As he weighed the metal shells in his hand, his face grew very serious. Each of them carried a message of death, but to him, as a sole means of making a fire, they were to him the bridge of life, and a precarious bridge at that. With at least three camps to make before he reached North Star Lodge, he recognized that the chances were almost desperate, and that only care and skill and a large slice of luck could carry him through. Very carefully, he stowed the cartridges where they would be safe against damp or accidental loss, and then proceeded to cook his meal. The next morning he started an hour before dawn. Light snow was falling, but he could not afford to regard that, and on snowshoes he pressed forward steadily. It began to blow, and he sought the lee of the river bank for shelter. Then that happened which put a term to his journey. A great tree, well up the bank, collapsed under its weight of snow. Roger Bracknell caught the rendering sound of its fall and instinctively leaped aside, but the snowshoes embarrassed him and he fell. A bough of the falling tree alighted on his right leg, snapping it like a pipe stem, and pinning him down in the snow. Under the first shock of pain he almost fainted, but in a minute or two recovered himself sufficiently to take stock of the situation. It was, as he instantly recognized, very desperate. He sat up and tried to move the weight from his leg. The bough which held him fast was not a very thick one, but the weight of the tree was behind it, and with his hatchet he began to cut through the branch. Every stroke he made jarred him terribly, and more than once he had to desist, but at last the bough parted, and he was able to push the weight from his leg. He was, however, in little better case, since he could not stand upright, and to crawl would have been futile even if the deepening snow had allowed the possibility of doing so. He looked round, and through the falling snow caught sight of the somber pine woods. They had a funeral look, and in their shadows brooded the menace of the north, which had surely overtaken him at last. Death was staring him in the eyes. He took out his pocketbook and made shift to write a note to his superior down at the post. Then he took out his pistol and loaded it with one of the cartridges that had held his life, but which now carried only death, swift and merciful. It was no use waiting. He held the pistol ready, and for a moment his thoughts strayed to Joy Gargrave. Would she ever hear? Would she guess that he? His thoughts broke off suddenly. Through the gloom of the falling snow, he caught a sound of voices. Someone, it seemed, was urging a dog-team to greater efforts. Was he dreaming? He listened carefully. No, there it was again, and with it came the yelp of a dog cut by a whip. A great wave of thankfulness rolled over him. He shouted and fired his pistol in the air. A moment later came an answering shout, and he called back again. Presently, out of the snow murk, emerged the forms of two men, Indians, and as they bent over him, he lapsed into unconsciousness. End of chapter 10than any other man in England. The confidence in him was extraordinary, but no one could be found to urge that it was not merited, and it was notorious that he had adverted more scandals and saved more reputations than any other half-dozen men in his profession. Erring husbands and wives, deeply wronged, sought his advice. And to the husbands he was a man of the world, and to the wives a sympathetic counselor, 
always against the extreme remedy of the divorce courts. To prodigal sons, he was the dispenser of parental allowances, and to the men caught in the toils of the blackmailer, he was like a delivering providence. As a family solicitor, he was unsurpassed, discreet as a cabinet minister at question time, and as secret as the grave. And in spite of his burden of secrets, usually, as he walked abroad among men, he wore a jaunty air, as befitted a man, with not a trouble of his own in the wide world. But one winter morning, as he sat in his private office, his brow was black with care, and his demeanor was as far removed as possible from the gay one which his conferees knew. Before him was a small ledger with a lock upon it and a number of documents, and as he bent over them, from time to time he wrote figures upon a sheet of foolscap. Presently he began to add up the figures, and that done, sat staring at the total. Ninety-seven thousand, he whispered to himself. God, if anything were to come out. He sat looking at the figures, tapping softly with his pencil, something like despair shining in his eyes. Suppose Adrian's fine scheme goes awry, or suppose Joy refuses to sign. He rose from his chair and began to walk to and fro in the manner of a man whose nervousness had made restless. Once he stopped and glanced at the ledger, then nodded his head. The others will be all right if... The whir of the telephone bell on his desk interrupted his thoughts. Frowningly, he picked up the receiver and gave the stereotyped, Hello? Is that really you, Adrian? I didn't know you had arrived. Last night, you say? I didn't get your telegram. I was dining with the Chancellor, and went on to the theater afterwards. Yes, you are in time, though I have been praying for your arrival for days. Things are very tight, and that banker is getting nervous. Yes, the sooner the better. In half an hour? That will do very nicely. I shall expect you both without fail. How goes your matrimonial scheme? Hmm. Hangs fire a little, does it? But you're certain of the end? Well, the earlier it is arranged, the better. I shall be pleased. My nerves are not what they were. But we can talk the whole business over later. Thank heaven, I'm her guardian, and there is only my consent to be obtained. What sort of a savage has she become in these three years? As he listened to the reply of his last question, a cynical smile came on his face. Sounds as if you have fallen in love. You have, hey? Well, well. <laughs> love is as good a qualification for matrimony as anything I know. Except a thundering big bank account. Yes, yes, I know. I shall be waiting. That's all, I think. Putting down the receiver, he began to gather up the scattered papers on his desk and after tying them together with tape, he placed them in a large envelope and sealed them with his private seal. Then he locked the books and placed both the book and the envelope in the safe. Care appeared to have fallen from him like a garment. He even hummed a little catch from the halls as he took from the safe a new set of papers. Anyone looking at him would not have known him for the care-ridden man ten minutes before. Once more he was the Sir Joseph Rayner, whom the city knew, smiling, cheerful, and exceedingly prosperous. That will do, I think, he said, as he arranged the papers on the desk. Fortunately, the girl has no business experience. Then he went to a small cabinet in the room and helped himself to a glass of port of a favorite vintage, and to while away the time smoked a couple of cigarettes gazing into the fire with amusing look upon his face. At the sound of voices in the office of the head clerk, he threw away the cigarette and turned to the door. A knock sounded, and the door opened. Miss Gargrave and Mr. Adrian, Sir Joseph. A moment later he was on his feet welcoming the travelers. This is a pleasure, Joy. I did not know that you had arrived until half an hour ago not having had the telegram which Adrian sent me. You look wonderfully well, and Adrian looks all the better for his vacation. Take this chair, Joy, and throw off your furs. 
The cigarettes are on the mantelpiece, Adrian, if Joy does not mind. He looked at her with a smile, and Joy shook her head. Not in the least, Uncle Joseph. Adrian knows that. Then we can indulge. But how are you? You have not yet told me, though of course there is no need. You have the authentic hue of health in your cheeks. And goodness, what a woman you have become. I can almost find it in my heart to envy Adrian the long journey you have made together. He laughed a little as he spoke and glanced from joy to his son. A slight frown showed itself on the young man's face, and interpreting it rightly, Sir Joseph deftly took another line. You have not found the journey too trying, I hope, my dear joy. But I forgot. Of course you are inured to the difficulties of hardships at North Star, and a journey of four or five thousand miles does not daunt you as it would a city man like myself. Joy laughed a little. There was not much hardship once we struck the railway. A first-class Pullman and a stateroom on a Canarder are in themselves alleviations of the tedium of a winter journey. Sir Joseph laughed with her. Possibly. But it is not everyone who would find them so. I think I could not undertake such a journey now, and I hope there will be no need for you to do so again. Now we have you this side of the herring pond. I hope we may keep you here for a very long time. Your days of exile are over, and North Star Lodge. Please, Uncle, Joy intervened quickly. Please do not say anything against North Star. I think of it as my home. I was born there, you know, and I have not found these three years to be like years of exile. They have been full of happy days. Possibly, laughed the lawyer, but there are many sorts of happiness, and after the pleasures of the wilderness, you will be the better fitted to appreciate the delights of civilization, since all things, as you know, gain by contrast. But where is Miss Lafarge, I thought? She's at the hotel. She was a little tired, but I think that was an excuse. She knew that I was coming here to do business. Of course, of course. Very considerate of her, I am sure. But there was no need for her to be so punctilious. But business is really of a very simple nature, merely the signing of a few documents which can be completed in under half an hour. He waved a hand towards the desk. I have anticipated your arrival, and everything is in order for your signature. Joy glanced at the desk and caught sight of the papers. Perhaps you'll explain what the situation is, she said. I'm not sure that I understand. Certainly, answered Sir Joseph, with a suave smile. It is not very complicated. Your father, as you know, left a very large fortune, something over a million pounds, in trust for you, and by his will made me your guardian and sole trustee. One of the conditions of the will was that for three years you were to live at North Star Lodge and at the end of that time you were to be free to enter upon your inheritance. You have fulfilled the condition, and you now inherit. Indeed, you ought to have done so some months ago, and as my trusteeship ended with the fulfilling of the conditions, there are certain actions of mine that ought to be regularized, and for which I shall require your signature. I do not quite follow, said the girl. It is very simple. You were not here to administer the estate, and though I had no authority from you, I was compelled to do so. Of course, as your uncle and guardian, there was really nothing else for me to do. Of course, of course, answered Joy hurriedly, and you want my signature, too, to put things right? Just that, answered Sir Joseph, smilingly. Then the sooner you have it, the better, laughed Joy. Shall I sign them at once? If you like, answered the lawyer in casual tones, though there was a little flash of eagerness in his eyes. It will take but a few moments. He moved toward the desk, and as Joy rose from her seat near the fire, placed a chair in position for her. The girl seated herself and glanced carelessly at the first document he placed before her, and then asked, Where do I sign? Here, answered the lawyer, indicating the place. Joy signed quickly. There were other papers that she did not even look at, but promptly signed each one in turn, 
as it was presented to her. When she had finished, she laid down the pen with a little laugh. I feel quite a woman of business. But you are not yet out of the wood, laughed Sir Joseph. There is another important matter to be settled, and that is the future management of the estate. It is now your own to do with as you like. You may wish to carry through all transactions related to yourself, in which case... Oh, no, no, cried Joy, protestingly. I should be worried to death. You must manage it for me in the future, as you have done in the past. I could not possibly undertake such a task. The lawyer smiled. I was hoping that you would think of that course, though for obvious reasons I did not care to suggest it. It will be much simpler for you merely to have money paid into your account instead of occupying perhaps several hours per week in worrying over investments. He laughed a little. You would require an office and at least a couple of clerks, Joy. Oh, dear, laughed Joy. That must never be. Then I will take the burden off your hands, and you will have to give me power of attorney. What is that? inquired Joy, adding merrily. I am discovering an abysmal ignorance in myself. Sir Joseph explained, and the girl nodded. Of course, there is no difficulty about that. It only gives you the right to continue to exercise the powers you have had up until now, and it will save me a great deal of worry. I suppose there will be another document to sign? Yes, answered the lawyer, smilingly. One more document to sign. Fortunately, I anticipated what your wishes would be, and I had it prepared. He looked at his son. We must have a witness, Adrian. Just ring for Benson, will you? The young lawyer touched a bell, and a moment later a clerk entered. Yes, Sir Joseph? In a moment, Benson, I want you to witness Miss Gargrave's signature. He went to the safe, took from it yet another document, which he gave to the girl. Read it, Joy. If I must, answered Joy, and ran through it carelessly. Then she signed it, and the clerk, having witnessed it, and been dismissed. Sir Joseph gathered all the papers together and locked them up. Business is over for the day, he said. I'm going to take a holiday. You will lunch with me at the Ritz, Joy. You and Adrian, I shall take no denial. But there's Babette, began Joy. Oh, we will telephone to her and pick her up on the way. We shall then be quite a complete little party, and tonight we will dine and go on to a theater afterwards. You will not have seen much acting of late. None at all, laughed Joy, for three whole years. Then we must certainly go, answered her uncle. Let me see. Ah, yes. There is the Grizzly Club, a Klondike play, pure American and very strenuous and exciting. I have seen it once, but I should like to see it again, with someone who knows the country of the play. To me it seems very real. And if it has illusions for you who know the life, I shall know that it is really good. We will go there, Adrian. Just tell Benson to ring up the mitre and engage a box for me, and have my car brought round from the garage. It was a merry party that lunched at the Ritz. There was not a hint of care that had betrayed itself in the lawyer's face in the solitude of his private room. He was the gay, debonair man of the world that all his acquaintances knew, and he exerted himself to make the lunch an agreeable one. But from time to time he allowed his eyes to stray towards a table where a couple of young men were lunching with a lady. They seemed very interested in his own party, and presently he saw the lady rise from her seat and walk towards his table. At the same moment Joy Gargrave looked up and as she caught the young lady's eyes, started impulsively from her seat. "'You, Penelope!' she cried. "'You, Joy!' mimicked the other. "'I thought you were dwelling in the forest primeval. "'I arrived in London last night. "'I expect to stay a little time in England. "'The years of what my uncle calls my exile are over.' She glanced at the lawyer. "'Do you know my uncle? No. "'Then I must introduce you, uncle.' This is Miss Penelope Winter, of old. 
"'You are wrong, Joy,' laughed the lady. "'This is no longer Miss Penelope Winter. "'This is Miss Will Grassmore of Grassmore Grange, Westmoreland.' "'You are married?' cried Joy. Mrs. Will Grassmore waved a hand towards the table she had just left. "'There sits the happy man whose complete happiness began three months ago.' "'Which began Joy, and then stopped suddenly as a curious look came on her face. "'Of course, I see. The other one is Geoffrey Bracknell, isn't it?' "'Yes,' laughed her friend, "'and he is dying to renew the acquaintance he began in Westmoreland four years ago. "'May I bring him and Will over? I see that, like ourselves, you are almost at the end of lunch. We might take coffee together.' For the fraction of a minute, Joy hesitated. Sir Joseph, who was watching her, noticed that hesitation, though he was the only one who did. Then Joy spoke. Well, if you like, Penelope, and if my uncle doesn't mind, I am his guest, and... Oh, Sir Joseph will not mind, I am sure, answered Miss Winter, flashing a smile at the lawyer and assuming his consent. Hurried back to her own table. Did you say that the young man with Mr. Winter was named Bracknell, asked Adrian Rayner suddenly. There was just a splash of color in Joy's cheeks as she replied shortly, yes. I wonder if there's any relation to the mounted policeman who came to North Star when... He is his cousin, answered Joy quickly. His father is Sir James Bracknell of Harrow Fell. Geoffrey is the second son. Ah, I remember them, broke in Sir Joseph. There was another son who disgraced himself and his family. He disappeared. I wonder what has become of him. The succession to that estate will offer a pretty tangle for somebody to unravel some day, Adrian. His son nodded, but uttered no comment. His eyes were fixed on Joy, as if he found something particularly interesting in her demeanor at the moment. At his father's words, the splash of color had ebbed swiftly from her cheeks, leaving them rather pale. But Joy's manner was perfectly self-possessed, and there was little to indicate that she was passing through a moment of stress. Her cousin still watched her when the others joined them, and at the moment of meeting flashed a quick searching glance at Geoffrey Bracknell. The young man's face was eager. There was a light in his eyes that told that Mrs. Winter's statement about his wish to renew acquaintance with Joy had not been overcolored, and as he marked it, Adrian Rayner smiled enigmatically to himself. Sir Joseph also noticed it, and it troubled him a little. He was thoughtful during the remainder of the lunch, and even more thoughtful when, on the evening of that same day, they again encountered young Bracknell in the foyer of the theatre. He was obviously waiting for them, and the lawyer was far from pleased to learn that he had taken the box next to his own. He was still less pleased when the young man made an excuse for visiting them between the acts, and it required all his skill to avoid an acceptance of an invitation to supper, which he extended to Sir Joseph's party. My dear Bracknell, you are too late. Our supper is already ordered. One other occasion, perhaps, but tonight it is quite impossible. You did not tell me you had an admirer, he said to Joy, rallying her a little time later. An admirer? Joy laughed. Who? Young Bracknell. He is most obviously in love with you. Oh, no, no, whispered Joy quickly, all the laughter dying suddenly from her face. You are mistaken. It, it would be too, too... The sentence went unfinished, and Sir Joseph, noticing her face, did not press for the conclusion. He was silent for a little time, wondering what lay behind her sudden change of manner. Then he spoke again. "'Young Bracknell is not your only admirer,' he said smilingly. "'You have another.' "'Indeed,' said Joy, very obviously embarrassed. "'Yes, Adrian is very deeply in love.' He confided the fact to me this morning. I hope, my dear, that you will be able to listen to him, that you will be able to give a favorable... 
Oh, interrupted Joy nervously, you must not ask me, uncle. I shall never marry, never. Never, my dear Joy. That, it is often remarked, is a very long time. He smiled indulgently as he spoke, and then added, I hope we may yet induce you to reconsider your very youthful decision. Joy did not answer. Her face was very pale, and she sat staring at the stage with tragic eyes, not watching the actors, but visioning a body lying in the snow in the somber woods at North Star. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Lady of the North Star by Otwell Binns》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Dastardly Deed How, as Corporal Roger Bracknell opened his eyes, this characteristic Indian greeting broke on his ears, and he stirred uneasily. Slowly, the full consciousness of things came back to him, and with it, the sense of intolerable pain in one of his legs. He raised his head to look at the leg and stretched a hand towards it at the same time. Another hand intervened hastily. No, not that. You damage the leg if you touch. It very bad. The corporal turned his eyes. The two men were standing near the bale of skins on which he was lying, one of them of pure Indian blood, and the second who had uttered the warning, manifestly a half-breed. Behind them in the darkness of the teepee was a third man, also an Indian. He addressed himself to the half-breed. How did I come here? Lagoon and Kamen, they find you on the trail. A tree have fallen and crack your leg like the shell of an egg. You not able to move, so that if they not come soon, you dead mans along of the cold which frees the blood. They bring you here, and I set the leg, so that it grow together again. That is all. Corporal Bracknell looked towards the two Indians. I am very grateful to you, Lagoon and Kamen, and I shall not forget, he said. I shall report good of them at the post. But where am I? At the winter camp of my people, was the reply. Of your people? Who are you, then? I am Chief Louis of the Elkhorn tribe. You hear of me, maybe? Yes, answered the corporal quickly. Who is there that has not? He looked with interest on the man, who was the son of a French-Canadian and an Indian mother, and who, throwing in his lot with his mother's people, had risen to the headship of the tribe. And while he looked at him, the chief spoke again. It is not good to walk alone in the north without dogs and sled, as Lagoon and Cannon find you. It is very bad, laughed the policeman weakly. Part of my dogs were stolen from me, and the others died. That is very bad, was the reply. Lagoon and Cannon, they find the sled and dead wolves, many of them. They have been poisoned. How befell it so? The corporal explained, carefully avoiding any reference to his cousin and the latter's Indian companion and when he had finished, the chief nodded approbation. That was clever to poison the wolves, for they have hunger madness at this time, the moose being scarce in the woods. For a little time Bracknell did not speak. Then he glanced down towards his leg and asked, Is it very bad? It will knit together like the ice on the river, was the reply, and you will not be lame mans. No, but two months will pass before you take the trail again. Two months? The ice will be breaking up by then. We, oui, that is so, but what matter? Time is long in the north, and we can talk together. Where did the trail lead for you, monsieur? I was making for North Star Lodge in the first instance. There, I hope to get dogs to take me to the police post. Chief Louis did not speak for a little time. He lit an Indian pipe, made of some soft stone with a hollowed twig for stem, pulled thoughtfully at it a few times, blowing out clouds of acrid smoke. Then he said slowly, "'You are going to North Star? You ever know Missy Gargrave's father?' "'No,' answered the policeman. "'He was dead before I came so far north. 
I understand that he was caught in the ice in the Yukon and lost. The bottom dropped out of the trail or something. Him die, we, oui, was the brief reply. Something in the other's tone caught the policeman's attention. He looked at him quickly. The half-breed's face was like that of a wooden image, but there was a glitter in the eyes that betrayed an excitement which the mask-like visage concealed. Ah, he commented, you know how Roth Gargrave died? I not say so, but I think and think, and I think it was not good the way Gargrave die. No. Bracknell waited, but the half-breed did not continue, and after a little time he said quietly, Tell me. Not now. It is the hour of the evening meal, and the tale will keep. I tell you another time. He knocked the ashes from his pipe, nodded gravely at the officer, and passed out of the teepee, leaving Bracknell the prey of a great curiosity. What on earth was the tale which the half-breed had to tell about Rolf Gargrave's death? He recalled the little that he had heard about the disappearance of the Northland millionaire, and could remember nothing which indicated that his death had been due to anything but an accident. As he remembered the story, the river ice on which Mr. Gargrave and his party of four Indians had been traveling had suddenly turned rotten. In Northland phrase, the bottom had dropped out of the trail, and the whole party had been drowned with a single exception. The exception was one of the Indians, who had managed to crawl out, and later in the day reached an Indian lodge there, after telling the story of the disaster, to die of cold and exhaustion. Mr. Gargrave's death had been a tragedy, but such tragedies were not uncommon in the North, and the police, hearing of the event months afterwards, had seen no reason for investigation. Every spring brought similar stories with it, and would, so long as men persisted in keeping to the ice trails, when once the spring thaw has set in. But Chief Louis' vague hints had perplexed Roger Bracknell, and awakened formless suspicions in his mind. Suppose that the death of Joy's father had not been an accident. Suppose? He broke off his conjectures. It was no use indulging in idle speculation when a short time would probably dispose of any need for them. He gave his mind to the consideration of his own position. As he recognized, his escape from death had been a very narrow one. And though he would have to remain where he was, probably for many weeks, he counted himself fortunate. Chief Louis held the mounted police in esteem, and would look after him well. And though the delay would probably mean that his cousin Dick would escape, he could not find it in his heart to regret that overmuch. The Indian, Joe, was another matter. He was convinced that by poisoning his dog food, the Indian had deliberately planned his death, and as he thought of the means employed, a hot wrath burned within him. It was so cruel, so treacherous, and he vowed to himself that one day he would make the Indian pay for it. His thoughts wandered further to Joy Gargrave. She would be in England, or well on her way there, and wondering how his quest had sped. He was now in a position to fulfill his promise to her. But he doubted whether such news as he had to send her would be any comfort to her. For the news that Dick Bracknell was alive, and making for the fastness of the northern wilderness, could hardly be good news for her, who had been so bitterly deceived. It was the next day when Chief Louise unfolded the mystery of Rolf Gargrave's death. Seating himself by the corporal's side, he puffed slowly at his pipe for some time, and the officer watched him, wondering what was in his mind and when he would speak. Suddenly the half-breed leaned forward and said abruptly, "'The bottom never drop out of the trail under Rolf Gargrave.' No. The corporal's voice was eager, and his manner alert. It was blown out. Blown out? What on earth do you mean, Louis? Listen, and I will the tale unfold. Three winters back, no four, there come to my teepee a white man 
who was not used to the ways of the North. With him was another man who had the coughing sickness and who need the squaws to nurse him. He die very shortly, six days after he come, and we give him tree burial, and the next day the other white man he comes to me. He want two men to go on trail with him to the north, and he pay with blankets, two rifles of the best, much cartridges, and many sticks of tobacco. He very anxious, and I ask him what for he go north before the spring it have arrived, and he say he go to find a man. What man? I ask, and he says Rolf Gargrave, whom he would talk with on business of importance. Then I understand, I think. Gargrave, he is a man of many affairs, and this man, who know not the way of the North, have come so far to talk of gold and the like. And I agree, and send two men of the tribe with him to find Gargrave of the North Star. They be good men, who know the ways of the trail as none other. But they are gone a very long time, and the wild geese have gone to their breeding grounds in the far north, and the river is free from ice when they return. I question them, and it is a strange tale they tell. For many days they travel with the stranger man, whose name I know not, and they are on the trail of Gargrave all the time. They hear word of him, now here, now there, and it is a long trail they follow but at the last they come up with him. They have word that he is but one camp ahead of them, and they push the dogs, and soon they pass Gargrave's camp. Pass it? cried the corporal in astonishment. We, oui, they pass the camp which is Gargrave's, and with the darkness falling, they push on five, six miles, and there pitch camp, and the stranger man, he says, wait for Gargrave there. It begins to snow, and there is wind, and they crouch by the fire, and sleep. One hour, two hours, three, I know not. Then Paslik and Cebu, they wake suddenly, and there is the roll of thunder in their ears. They listen in wonder, and again they hear it. A crash, like that among the hills, when the sun scorches the grass, and the earth is shakes and tremble. They look about. The white man's sleeping bag is empty, and he is not there. They wait a long time. The thunder sound no more, but the snow still fall, and presently the stranger man he return. He have on the snowshoes, and he have been on a journey. He tells Paslik and Cebu that he not sleep, that he have been for a little walk to help him. But he is very tired, and there is a strange look on his face, and Paslik he whispered to Cebu that the stranger man have been a long journey. The snow is still falling, and they all sleep till dawn. All next day in the camp they wait for the coming of Gargrave, but he come not, and Paslik he see that after a time the man looks not towards the river trail, and that there is a pleased look on his face, a look of one who has his desire given unto him. The next morning they strike camp, and the stranger man, he says, they go back and look for Gargrave. To Paslik and Cebu, the way of the white man is foolishness, but they go back, and three miles down the trail, they find the ice have been broken in. It have frozen over again, and the snow above have melt and frozen in with the ice, and it is rotten. Also, there are great chunks of ice thrown far out over the snow, which is a strange thing. They cross the broken trail with care, and at the far side they come on the tracks of two sleds that have moved in the direction of the rotten ice. The stranger man, he looks at these, and then he looks back at the broken trail, and then he whistles cheerfully all to himself. Paslik, he look and he reads the signs, and he whispers that the sleds have gone in, the sleds and the man, and then they go forward till they reach the camp of Gargrave that they pass on the way. He is not there. The camp is removed, and the ashes of the fire are cold. The white man, he looks, and he laugh, but it was the laugh of a man who is not disappointed, 
You understand? We have missed him, he say. We return to Dawson. So Paslik and Cebu, they go to Dawson with him, and there they hear that Gargrave is lost because of the bottom dropping from the trail and casting him in the river. One man, he have crawled out. He tell the tale and die, and Paslik and Cebu say nothing. And the stranger man, he gives them his dogs and sled and stores and leave Dawson. Presently, when the river is open, they come back and whisper to me the tale of their wanderings. And I say the trail, it not fall in, but is blown out. The half-breed broke off, and lighting his pipe, puffed at it stolidly, staring into the fire. For a full half-minute the corporal did not speak. The implications of the other story were very clear to him, but they seemed incredible. "'But what makes you so sure?' he asks at last. Chief Louis rose from his seat, and without speaking, passed from the teepee. A few minutes later he returned, bringing with him a wooden box with a hinged lid. He opened it and held it towards the corporal, who looked in curiously. Inside, half wrapped in cotton wool, were four cakes of some reddish-brown material, and when the corporal's eyes fell on them, he gave vent to a sudden exclamation. Ah! You know what that is? You have before it seen? Yes, answered Bracknell quickly. It is dynamite. How did you come by it? The stranger man, he leaves it in the stores that he gives Peslik and Cebu. He forget it, or he think they get meddling with it and blow themselves to hell. But they bring it back, and I know it, and I keep it, and remembering the winter thunder which Paslik and Cebu they hear in their sleep, I say, the trail it was blown up and not fall in. Behold, Paslik and Cebu, with the stranger man, go all the way to Dawson, and the trail is good. Upon my word, Louis, I believe you are right. There is no question. It is so sure as the rising of the sun. A dark thought shot in the corporal's mind. Four winters ago this had happened, and in that year Dick Bracknell, who had trapped Joy Gargrave into marriage, had fled from England. Rolf Gargrave's death might be conceived to serve the interests of his son-in-law, and Rolf Gargrave had been murdered. Louis asked abruptly, what sort of man was he whom Paslik and Cebu served? He was tall, with full beard and dark eyes. His voice was of the English and not of the American, for he talked not through the nose. The description was not very illuminating, and the policeman almost groaned. His hair, did you mark the color? It was like the bear, what you call brown, it's the brown of the woodnuts in autumn. Brown? Dick Bracknell's was brown, but then... So was the hair of half the Anglo-Saxon race. As his mind clutched at this fact, seeking escape from the awful thought which was taking possession of it, he frowned. "'You know the man?' asked the half-breed. "'No,' he cried violently, "'no.' "'All the same,' said Chief Louise stolidly, "'that man, he blows up the trail.' And from that conclusion, at any rate, Roger Bracknell, could find no escape. End of chapter 12